In the Bible, Paul explains that everyone has two bodies, a physical body and a spiritual body. Mediums use their spiritual bodies when they act as a communication bridge between the physical and spirit worlds. As a spirit speaks, mediums hear the information using the ears of their spiritual bodies, then repeat the information to other physical people. Mediumship is synonymous with the biblical term, gifts of the spirit. The focus of our show, Making Known the Unknown, is to provide knowledge through the use of Reverend Hewitt's mediumship and Sidney Schwartz's research. The Bible contains the history of psychic events, along with man-made doctrines created by priests centuries ago. This show will explore the untruths which the Bible entrenched into our society. By uncovering these untruths, we encourage people everywhere to think for themselves with a critical mind. Hello, and welcome to Making Known the Unknown. I'm your host, Tina Tarek, and with me are my regular guests and experts, Mr. Sidney Schwartz, middle school teacher from Hackensack, New Jersey, and Bible researcher of how many years now, Sid? 25 plus. Oh, wow. Welcome, Sidney. Hi, Tina. And Reverend Carl Hewitt, founder and pastor of Gifts of the Spirit Church right here in Chesterfield, Connecticut, and medium. Welcome, Carl. Thank you. Okay. Some of you may have noticed that we haven't uh, done a show in a little while. It's been a few weeks. And so what I thought we'd do right off the bat is um, kind of catch up with what's been going on with Carl and Sid uh, and some of the plans that they are making for the future. Not, a, not only of this program, possibly, but of, uh, well, I, I, won't, I won't blow this, the, the secret. You can tell them. Okay. Go ahead, Sid. <laughs> Well, um, the other day I, I received an email, and it was it was quite interesting because it, it showed a picture of a a holy site in Jerusalem, which was the Western Wall, the Wall of Solomon's Temple. And if the control room could bring the uh, bring the graphic up that I prepared, the, the email was actually a picture with a caption on it, and the uh, and the caption said, "Can you hear me now, God?" With a man standing with a cell phone at the Western Wall. <laughs> It's traditional that um, at the Western Wall that people write little messages out that they ask God for favors and stick it in the cracks of the wall. Um, and that's not visible here. But it, it, what, what was really so poignant, I thought, was the fact that here, here you have the message, can you hear me now, God? And obviously this man is, is, is on a cell phone. And if, if, if he was really trying to talk to God, he'd be talking to a God that's outside of himself in the sky somewhere. Where, where we have, we've been taught and, and we are learning that God is really within and that you can address to God, the Lord God of your being, not with a cell phone, but by thought and talking directly to, to, the, uh, to, to your soul that's within your chest because that is the Lord God of your being. It is God. It is God. See, he didn't have a piece of paper in his pocket to leave a note in the crack, so he took his phone out of the pocket and called God. Right. I think that's clever. You know, it's, it's, al <laughs> it's also interesting. When Carl and I were in Turkey, we went to a site that was outside of Ephesus, and it was supposed to be a, a house that Mary lived at. And there was a wall there, too, and it was full of papers, just like the Jews wrote, write papers to God. Well, mm -hmm. these people were writing messages to Mary asking for asking for favors for Mary, Mary to, to, to do. So it was the same exact thing, and I thought that was so interesting that both religions were doing that, because I didn't know that that existed in Catholicism. So this, w this would sort of be called the picture of the week. Yes. And, and this is the wall. <laughs> this is the wall in Jerusalem. Yes, the Western wall. And this wall. is not an uncommon thing. No. Uh, well, the cell phone is, but people go to go okay. to the wall to wall to the wall to pray and and to leave these little messages. And in fact, there's mm -hmm. even a website where that if you if you like some if someone's ill or something like that, they email they email people at in Jerusalem and they write out the, the message and they stick it in the wall for you. That's what I was thinking. He might have been doing is talking to someone else at a distance mm -hmm. who couldn't be there and relaying their their wish or their message. Could be. But can you imagine if he was really talking to God? what the long distance bill would be. Well, uh, well, I just had to throw that in there. There was a local call from there. <laughs> okay, that's right, yeah, that's right. I forgot. That's right. <laughs> okay, nobody's laughing. I thought that was really funny. Okay. They are at home. <laughs> okay, Carl, what have you been up to? Well, I had a phone call. I get a lot of phone calls. 
And there's a lady called up the other day, and she says, this Mr. Hewitt? And I said, yes. And she says, I saw your show the other night for the first time. And she says, I was flipping the channels. And she says, and this channel, this, this station went on, and I saw this man with a turtleneck. And she says, I love men with <laughs> turtlenecks. And she says, I just sat there watching it. I became so interested in what you people were saying. She said, I want to watch your show every night, but make sure you wear a turtleneck. <laughs> so I got the same one I had on that night. Okay. <laughs> then I did get a phone call this week. And uh, this, uh, this young lady from somewhere in this vicinity, I'm not going to name the little town, and uh, she had called for a reading for quite some time ago, and uh, finally I, I gave her the appointment. She came in, and she said that, <clears throat> she said something to me that really disturbed me. It really got, got me upset. And uh, it's hard for me to believe that somebody else out there watching this program would not get upset at this. And she said that where she and her husband lives, we live right side of the Catholic Church, and she said that her parents were Catholic, but she said she was never hung up on any religion. But she and her husband, now she has a fabulous marriage. Her husband and her, they're just wonderful people. They get along wonderful. She couldn't have any children, but she wanted to adopt a child, and they adopt a little baby from uh, Korea, I believe it was. And they're wonderful parents. You know, this, these two people are wonderful. And uh, so she entered into the school, uh, the, into the church right next door, and she was going to the lessons, you know, for confirmation. And uh, somewhere along towards the end of that session of lessons, mm -hmm. the teacher asked her for, to, to, she wanted to, the teacher wanted to see her marriage license. So she brought the marriage license in and she, looked at it and she closed the book. She says, you can't be here. You can't uh, be confirmed. She says, what do you mean? And she said, well, I'll have the priest call you today. That afternoon, the priest called her and said, is this true that you uh, uh, were married in a, in a, uh, in a um, Protestant church? And she says, yes. And he says, well, your marriage is a farce. And that was the end of the conversation. She, I said, what did you say to him? She says, well, if I'd have said to him what I was thinking of saying, she says, I don't know what would have happened to the phone. And I said, well, why didn't you say it? I said, some of these people have to get, they, somebody have to wake them up. But what, saying that to a person, hmm. that as good as this couple, hmm. that have the love to bring up a child hmm. from another part of the world, right. And to say that she couldn't be confirmed because she wasn't. And so my message to the people watching this program, if that system, that organization, is not into mind control, I wish to, somebody would explain that to me. It is mm -hmm. pure mind control, and I'm saying this because those in the other dimension, just like in the Bible, and the word of the Lord came to me, said this, this, and this, I don't. I don't address those entities as the Lord because I know better because they all have names just like they had here. And uh, I was told that it is all mind control. The whole system is mind control because it is a huge business. And, for, and furthermore, the church keeps changing their mind on their doctrines, as, as we'll talk about today with marriage. Mm -hmm. um, Years ago, marriage wasn't even part part of a church. It wasn't even a sacrament in in, in the in the uh, in the church until twelve fifteen. So so there wouldn't if if this had happened in the year nine hundred, there wouldn't even it, the church wasn't even marrying people. Now I just wanted to go back on on Carl's experience um, with what that woman uh, said to you. So this is one one religion telling the other religion that because they weren't married in their religion That's right. that it wasn't legitimate. Right. That's right. terrible. And this poor child had to go through how many months of this, you were saying? I think it was eight Doesn't or nine. Doesn't that cost money along the way? I think so. I don't know. Just to be dropped? As far as I'm concerned, nothing you get there is, uh, is for free. Well, you know what I'm thinking? It was probably meant to be for that couple not to be part of this. And it was probably a blessing in disguise. Could have been a blessing mm -hmm. in disguise. I bet that. But she said, she said that she was uh, married in the... Uh, 
uh, in the, uh, what is the name of that church I talked about? I don't remember. Methodist, in the Methodist church. Oh, wow. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. And if it wasn't a thinker, if it wasn't a thinker way back that analyzed all of this, they would not have protested and there would not be any of the Protestant churches today. You see, oh. it took a person that saw through the whole thing. Remember what his name was? And he nailed Martin, a, Martin Luther. Martin Luther, he nailed a note on the door. And he was very much against selling indulgences, which is the way the, the Vatican was paid for. Right, that's right. You know, it's, it's right. unbelievable that the, the very intelligent people that I meet and they get caught up in this mind control. I mean, it's mind boggling. Hmm. And you can't, there's so much in mind control, you can't even get them to say a word about it. Not even a word. But this young woman, uh, she was a good a thinker for herself. And she and her husband get along wonderful. Well, she called you. Yeah. She knew that there, were, there was some reason you had to be involved in this and yeah. for her to ask you about this or share this with you. Yeah. And uh, I think that was a good thing for her. I've had so many people uh, come to me over the years after uh, being, uh, seeing the program or hearing the radio mm -hmm. and uh, come to me and the stories that they tell me are sad, sad, sad. Especially the one in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, this is where this poor man who business got so bad with him, he was a, he was a, a carpenter. Business got so bad he didn't have anything on the books. He had many, he had to pay. And he was told by the, the local uh, uh, priest there if he would, uh, uh, he would get some kind of confirmation or condens cons I don't know what it was. He's going to be paid mm -hmm. in some way or other. If Compensation, he would, right? Yes, if he would build this uh, or help build this uh, rectory. And though the poor man and his crew built the rectory, complete, complete. And then at the end of that, there was still no work coming in for the man, and he had no money to pay his men. And he went there and asked for money to buy groceries for his family, and they sent him to the Salvation Army. Can you imagine that? He wanted to borrow some money, and that whole family came down to me because they saw me on TV, TV in Boston. And they came down to see me, and it was a sad day. Hmm. Sad day. I, know, I was broken up just listening to what they had to say. When I see how elaborate some churches are, and then I see the people that live around them and how poor they are yeah. mm -hmm. in comparison to or relative to I really wonder, it must cost a lot of money to heat, a lot of space going up to spirals in the yep. sky. And who lives up there? No, 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 no one. Well, when Sid, Air. when Sid and I went to Europe, we went all over France looking at these uh, cathedrals because the spirit teachers uh, wanted me to do that. And we did. And there was some there was like 35 stories high. And uh, spirit told me that in those days they were built that God is up there, and the higher the building, the closer mm. to your f to His feet you are. Right. What a bunch of garbage. Think about all the building materials that were yeah. used that are wasting, sure. this wasted space that could help people have homes mm -hmm. that needed shelter, and the bills for the heating and the cooling. <laughs> it's just, it's unbelievable. Let alone all the gold that they put on the altars. Oh, sure. And yeah. the thing... Sure. The thing that bothered me so much is uh, I, they took me backwards in time to see it being constructed and the men that would fall off of the scaffolding and, break, and get killed. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of them. They were dragged like animals in and dropped in this pit, which is a part of the yard around that, that building. Very sad. Mm. No prayers, nothing. Just throw them in the pit. And after so many in there, they covered it all up. Forgot all about him. They got so he wouldn't enter the cathedrals. He was so aggravated with I wouldn't go with him. in these places again. You know, that makes me think of a question that I have been wanting to have you share with our viewers for several weeks and since the beginning of this season. And after we dive into that, then I want to go into the topic this week, week which is marriage. Very interesting, folks, what, what I have learned that these gentlemen have researched. And the, and the question, and I've had it posed to me, and that's why I'm going to pose it to you, Carl and Sydney. You can obviously share in the response. Is why this season we are not live. 
because most of our viewers have been remembering that we were live and we were call in and you could you could ask questions and there was a very specific reason why we're not doing that anymore and I wanted to know if you want to share that. Before we started this I was told that uh, once we get started and certain people of certain churches members of the uh, church would when they found out what we were going to be teaching they would call in and and block the phones and try to use up the whole 30 minutes or 60 minutes of our show so that we could never get our message across. And when that happened, you remember that night it happened, mm -hmm. I say, take those damn phones off of the set. I'm not going to have them on the set. Otherwise, I'm not going in there again. Mm -hmm. And that's why they can't call in live here. Because they themselves would stay on the lines. They'd stay on the line. Right. You would be tied up talking to them. Their, right. okay. their, idi their idiotic message would go out there and not ours, you see. Okay, all right. We've done research, we've done our homework, and I say to all the people, do your homework okay. and you'll find out the truth just like we have. Mm. This guy was the biggest skeptic that I have ever met, and today he's an expert with this. He would never turn back to the ignorance he was taught before. Good. Now, with that, Mr. Expert, <laughs> I'm going to ask you about marriage. Now, all of us have our own understanding about what that matrimonial, sanctimonious union institution means. Mm -hmm. And you and I were chatting about another show at another time in the past. And uh, we weren't talking about marriage, but you quite incidentally ran across a passage in the Bible that talked about uh, a time when men had multiple wives. Yes. And I said, gee, I didn't think that sounded very biblical or appropriate. And you said, yeah, don't you know that marriage was created or invented? And I said, okay, we need a show about this. This is good. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sid. Okay. Well, the, the, the verse you were talking about is Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 15. And it begins by saying, if a man has two wives, he's to do X, Y, and Z. Um, basically, marriage in, in biblical times was a, was a contract between uh, uh, between uh, uh, between families, actually, because the the husband was actually purchasing the, the his wife from the father mm -hmm. of the of the, of the family. Uh, in the in, if we could have the uh, graphic of a, of a marriage contract, even today in Judea, Judaism. They have a. Uh, they still do the marriage contract. This is called a ketubah in Hebrew, and it's a contract. Obviously, it, I don't believe it says that that the that the uh, groom has to pay two goats to get the wife, as as the way it would have in biblical times. Mm -hmm. But I think there's certain agreements uh, that that are written out. I've never really studied what's actually in in a ketubah. But this is an example of them, and they're still written out today. And some of them are quite ornate, as as this one uh, as this one is. But uh, it's kind of like the the idea of dowries um, that uh, that the w wife had to bring some sort of goods in, 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 into the marriage. But um, but basically, in order to get married, if you read the story about um, uh, let's see, it was Isaac. He went. He went to his his uncle Laban, and he he fell in love with uh, Rebecca, and Rebecca had a, had his older sister Leah, and he he uh, the deal was he had to work for, for he had to work seven years in order to marry to marry the, uh, Rebecca, and. Um, so, so he went and he worked the seven years, and the, and the father was having a problem because the oldest daughter was supposed to get married first. So what would happen was that he, he, uh, he there came time for the ceremony, and obviously there wasn't a rabbi then. Rabbis weren't around. This was all done by families. Uh, so they, they, they brought the, the bride in, and she was covered over and veiled over, and they got married, and they went through whatever ceremony they did, and, uh, and, and, uh, and Isaac lifts up the veil, and it was the eldest daughter. It was the older, older daughter, Leah, and he had to work another seven years to get to bride he wanted. Oh but, but in those days, they could have more than one wife. They could also have have uh, pseudo wives called called concubines. Uh, when 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 Abraham. Um, and Sarah couldn't have a child for the longest time. Uh, Sarah, Sarah finally said, "Well, take this woman and have a child with her," and and that that was Ishmael. And eventually, she she became pregnant and had had Isaac. Uh, so so this is the way it worked back then. Okay. Um, 
so, but there was no marriage, you know, the marriage was basically a legal agreement between families. So when did it go from bigamy to monogamy, would you say? Mon uh, monogamy uh, became, uh, that was a Christian idea. Okay. Uh, and in, in the Middle Ages... some money, too. In the Middle Ages, um, it was, it was at 12.15, and I believe the Council of Trent, they, they came up with the idea of, of, of that uh, people needed a priest in order to get married, and they needed to get married in a church. And that way they could charge the people for the ceremony, and at, this, is, this is the time that cathedrals were being built. And again, in the control room, we brought a couple of pictures of, of some cathedrals with us that we were talking about before, if they, if they could uh, start showing them. This is the Cathedral of Milan, and you can, wow. see, you can see how how elaborate this particular uh, bu building is. Um, the next one that's, that we have is a picture of Reims. This is where Joan of Arc uh, went had, and had Charles VII uh, crowned. This is a drawing of it. It's not an actual a, a photograph of it. Okay. The next one ha is an e the interior of the Toledo Cathedral in Spain. Wow. And you can see all the gold and all the different images. It's mm -hmm. hard to see there, but all those different things are, are carvings of, of different Bible stories. Because one of the things about the cathedrals was that, that the people were illiterate. They couldn't, they couldn't read the Bible. And the only way they could learn the Bible was to look at the pictures in the stained glass and, and the different statuary that was, was around there. Hmm. So, so um, but obviously all this stuff took lo lots of money to build. Mm -hmm. So the institution of marriage helped to finance this. Another way that the cathedrals were, were financed was that they borrowed money from the Jews because don't forget in the medieval times, uh, Christians weren't allowed to, to charge interest on loans. So, uh, so one of the few things that, that Jews were allowed to do because they were forced to live in, in ghettos at the time and they were only allowed certain professions and money lending was one of them. Um, and lots of times what would happen was when it came time for the church to pay back the money, they had a pogrom, they rounded up all the Jews, they slaughtered them, and obviously they didn't have to pay back the loans. Oh. So that, that was, it was one thing, something that happened uh, over and over again. But, but it was during the medieval period that, that it was decided that, uh, that there should only be, uh, you know, a man should only have one wife. And Judaism decided because they were living in the Christian uh, community and weren't really like full citizens all, all over the place. They decided they would, they would fit in better if they if they began having just one wife too. So they stopped they stopped the practice of having multiple wives. So up until that time, it was something that the families just agreed upon. Yes. Okay. There was families just agreed upon it, and it didn't it didn't require clergy at all. Uh, in, in order to in order to for um, to get married, so it was maybe more out of necessity to continue the family lineage, the bloodline, what have you. Right. Okay. And the other thing too was in biblical times, you know, he, uh, everybody wanted children because when you got old, there was no social security, and your children would support you when you were couldn't work anymore, you know, and couldn't do right. the farming and all right. the, all the other things. Right. So it, children were very important, a very important commodity if you want to look at it that way. Hmm. Um, but uh, this, this, is what, this is how this all happened. Um, so tell me, in 1215, the, which uh, church or organization actually created this? Um, I have a quote here, and it says, given the persistent misgivings about uh, Western Christianity about heterosexual ma matrimony and its functions, it's hardly surprising that it should have taken until the Fourth Lateral Council in 1215 for the church to dedicate, to declare it a sacrament or to develop elaborate mechanical ca rules about the mode of performing it. So it wasn't in 1215 that, that the church finally made, made marriage a sacrament. Uh, and, and then they said that you had to get married in a church. You couldn't get married outside of the church. And make, that's part of it was because they needed, needed the money. So it sounds like the majority of it was that they needed money. Whose business yes. was it? They Whether also, people were getting together or not. They also uh, passed a law, unwritten law uh, in this case, that a couple getting married could never have, they never could have sex unless they brought a child into the world. So the more children you have, the more members of the organization, you see? Well, we see, well I see that going on today. Yes. That's yeah. not unusual. I, I had a very good friend uh, way back, and he was the 19th child of the family. My goodness. They barely, barely got along. The poor mother, she never had a chance to, 
she was uh, mending and sewing and keeping the clothes ready for the you know the children to stay them in school. She, he told me that she slept on in the rocking chair all the time because she never even had a chance to go to bed at night. She had too many kids in school, and she tried to get all of them to have a good education. Mm. And he was the only one of that family. He was the last one. He was the 19th one. Mm. He was the one that uh, really had it in for the priest, and he told him. And there's this one priest that really was honest with him and told him the whole story. I was there. I witnessed that. Mm. So it, it also sounds, too, in history that not only were children commodities, but women were commodities oh, sure. to right. be sold and purchased. You have a sure. talking about a contract. Right. Well, even this is not a marriage license we're talking about in those days. This contract that you were showing. This I'm contract? No, no. This isn't a license. This is a contract. This, this, this is according to what needs to be done according to Jewish law. Okay. When a person, when a Jewish couple gets married today, they have to follow the civil civil laws and get a marriage contract. Right. But, but religiously, they have to get this ketubah, this marriage contract. Would you say it's like a prenuptial agreement? In a sense, it kind of is, okay. because it it talks about what would happen if 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 things dissolved and what what obligations the husband has in order to to maintain the wife and things. Okay. All right. Um, I came across an article myself, and I wanted to throw this out for comment. Um, it's um, from the website of CBS2, and uh, I actually saw it on TV, and I went to, to get the information after the fact, and uh, it was a 60 Minutes special report, okay. and it was called For the Love of Money, and it was showing how in India now <laughs> there are dowries and arranged marriages, and what would happen is the... Uh, the young lady who wants to get married would have to pay the groom's family so much money to be able to be part of his family. What would happen is her future mother-in-law and the groom would get together and they'd set up, it looks like a business in doing this and it essentially became extortionist because they would say, okay, for $50,000, we'll do this. Um, and then they'll, they'll give the, uh, the money to the, um, prospective groom and the prospective mother-in-law, and then uh, they'll say, the prospective groom and mother-in-law, that they've run out of money, you need to give us more money, otherwise we're not going to marry your daughter or take care of your daughter, or the prospective groom will go into a business and say, I need more money to set up this business. And what had happened to this one particular young lady, um, and I believe it was right at her actual ceremony, is that she said she'd had enough because they kept trying to come back and get more and more money from her to marry into their family. She was the only one that came forward, hmm. Hmm. and she's suing them. Right, and because she did that now, a lot of young Indian women hmm. um, are, are, her name is Nisha Sharma. Yeah. Um, and, they, and because of the precedent she's setting, a lot of Indian women are now refusing to become part of this. Of course, this whole process is actually illegal but it's also become part of a tradition and a custom mm -hmm. and nobody really talks about it. Nobody. Well, now they're talking about it. And I thought that was fascinating. They actually also say that there are sections of prisons reserved for prospective, <laughs> I guess they never got to marry him, grooms and mother-in-laws who violate the rules <laughs> and the laws and commit these kinds of crimes. And that the prisons are actually, that section of the prison is, is actually growing faster than they can keep up with it because yeah, but, of what but, they're doing. But there's a very dark side to it because that, that show also talked about the fact that many, um, many families, if they have a daughter, if they give birth to a daughter, will kill the daughter because they don't, they don't want to get into this whole, whole dowry situation. Right. And that how some places, there's, no, there's not enough women to marry. Right, right, that's true. There, there are several towns, but there are, are a lot of men and no women. <laughs> right. Very interesting. Uh, quite a few years ago, a model, I, can, I remember her, she walked in the door and everybody would drop their teeth, you might say, because she was black, she was from Long Island, mm -hmm. and she was about six foot two, very tall, beautiful, beautiful woman. She came to me for a reading, and uh, in the reading, uh, she seemed to be very pleased with the reading, but she was told that she would meet a man in, in Rome and marry him, and he, he was doing documentaries, and she, that tr came true. 
she wound up, she wrote me a long letter later, and she went to Rome on a vacation, she and her sister, and she did meet this man there who was a cameraman, and uh, married him, and went to India, and he was doing a documentary, and the same thing was going on as we were talking about just mm -hmm. a moment ago. This one young woman, uh, because the, um, her parents would not give the groom's uh, parents a certain amount of money. Mm. They poured gasoline on that young woman. Are you kidding me? And they burned her, burned her alive. Jeez. They killed her. They killed her. Oh my goodness! And she said, "Carl, now this is my this is my client." Right. She says, "Carl, don't ever come to this country. You couldn't handle it. You could not handle here. She, she says, you're too sensitive." Wow. I don't want to ever go there. Wow. I all, even hate to read about it. All because of marriage. Yeah. Now, you know what my thought has been? That the definition of marriage is a union of two things. You can have a union of two things, two people, two ideas, what have you. Where is it that it's so important that it becomes a legal process? Why does the law ever have to be involved in this at all? That, that I don't get because it almost seems like when the marriage breaks apart, so many awful, horrible things grow up out of this, and so many people make so much money yeah. and have mm -hmm. wonderful jobs and livings and careers and an industry out of marriages breaking up that exactly. it, it, it doesn't make any sense. It like keeps it going. Right. It, it's a system that keeps it going. I have a client, a woman, hope she's not listening, She's a lawyer, and that's the only thing she handles is divorces. Mm. And uh, she lives high on the hog, mm -hmm. as they say down south, mm -hmm. on just that. Now, what about the stigma of divorce? Why should there be a stigma at all? Isn't it a mistake? I think it's a sin for two people to live together and there's no love. I think it's a sin for them to do that. That's true. But what I'm saying is, why is there such a stigma behind people who do get divorced? Where does that come from? Where has that been planted in our brains? It comes from it in the Bible, and I think it's in the, in the book of Matthew where it says, and, what, and what, what God has joined together, or in some Bible it says yoked together, uh, let, no man, let no one cast asunder. Yoked like oxen? Yoked like the oxen. I just <laughs> typed that the other day. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yoked together. Oh, lovely. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the Bible. The Bible makes us feel guilty when we make mistakes. But the Bible was written by men. Yeah, but most people don't believe that. Well, they don't know that. And, and a lot of and a lot of these <laughs> and a lot of these changes were made. Well, probably that was put into the Bible after after this fourth uh, collateral council in 1215, once they once they institutionalized marriage, because a lot of the changes had, had to have taken place in the Bible all throughout the Middle Ages. Mm. They were, they were re-editing it. It's a control, isn't it? Yes. Allow me to drop a bomb. Go for it. <laughs> One time, this was a few years ago, not too many years ago, I was talking to one of the ascended masters and I said, because uh, he was explaining to me that God was within and he said the Bible was written by men. And then he said, stop and reason this. If God, the big man in the sky, created heaven and earth and everything in between, then why would he have created a competitor, which would have been the devil? And if this God has the ability to give you life and take it away from you, why doesn't he strike that old son of a bitch and the devil and get rid of him and have right. peace on the earth? Right. He says, doesn't that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, it does. He said, the Bible was written by men. It was not written by God. Mm -hmm. Ten Commandments was written by men, not God. If it was God that wrote the Ten Commandments, why didn't he say something about the devil there? There's nothing mentioned in the Ten Commandments about the devil. He said, it was all created by the church. Hell was created by the church. The devil was created by the church. He said, God is within, always has been. He says, this great teacher that you know by the name of Jesus said that you're born with two bodies. You're born with a physical body and you're born with a spirit body. And God is spirit, as Jesus also said. And then when the physical body dies, it instantly gives birth to the spirit body and you go on living in a dimension that you created yourself. Christianity doesn't do well without a devil because without a devil and without hell, what's Jesus going to save you from? Right. And every and every nothing right. to save you from. Right. And if therefore, if there's nothing to save you from, why was he sacrificed? The, right. the whole thing falls apart without a devil. Right. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything wrong 
with people who are married or the institution of it if those two souls are to be together and they're meant to be together. What I'm saying is I think that the whole legal process brings it down, twists it, turns it, and makes it very difficult if there's going to be a divorce. And, and divorce is no different than you making any other type of mistake in your life. Yet, there's this stigma that's been attached to it, again, I'm saying this, that goes across the board, and it's like it's some kind of a taboo, just like homosexuality, just like anything else that they might think of as a sin, mm -hmm. um, or immoral, or not acceptable. And I think that, that, that religion really should just stay out of people's lives, and the law should stay out of people's lives with respect to marriage. There are several couples out there right now that they're telling me, someone is with me, they're telling me right now that they would like my comment on gay marriages. Well, I personally don't think they should use the word marriage. I'm sure they'll come up with mm. something else, mm. because if they use the word marriage, then some people will think if, if these two men are married, or these two women are married, then that, that, that ruins the word marriage with a heterosexual couple, mm. you see. Mm. I mean, I don't see anything wrong with the government. If the government has got to have something to do with people uh, marrying mm. uh, or becoming legally together to try to save on taxes and things, mm. I remember very well a story. It was in a paper. It, w it went into paper. It was in a lot of papers, magazines, and everything. It was about this this couple of women. They were very close. They had been together for like forty years, and one of them got in an accident, and she was in the she was in the hospital intensive care. And because she was the other one, her partner was not related to her. The hospital would not allow her in the room, and she kept calling her name out all the time. And the parents, they were elderly, but they were still around. Mm. They would not allow the partner to come in there, yet they'd been together for almost 40 right. years. Right. What a terrible thing this must be. Because they're not legally recognized. Yes. Right. And that does more damage than good. Yes. Yes. And it prevents them from having a lot of things. And as we've said on this, on this program, that anyone, uh, any male... Any male that is drawn to another male is simply because the soul has crossed mm -hmm. over and mm -hmm. it's a female soul in his body. Right. And if it is a woman is attracted to another woman, it is because the soul in her body has become masculinized, you see, and that's why she's drawn to another female. It becomes so simple. This guy's done so much research here on the book that is about to come out, and the name of the book is Crossovers. The people in the world of spirit, Awan, the angel without a name, he's the one that gave us all the data. This is why we went to Turkey. We found the, we found the fountains where these little girls at three years old uh, were brought by the, pair, uh, by the mother because it was a law of the church mm -hmm. that the women did not have a soul. And the only way that they would have a soul is that the priest would stretch the child's vagina, have sex with it to put God in the child so that this woman would have God in her, see? And that went along for 400 some years, and this is why there's so many crossovers all over the planet today. So the governments should reconsider and do something about the people that really need a change. Remember the title, Crossovers. Crossovers. When it comes out, we will share that with you on the show and the book will also be in many other locations available to everyone. I uh, wanted to uh, shed some light on an author. Well, he's an, uh, he's an author, he's a doctor first. He uh, is a hypnotherapist and he sort of stumbled upon a gift that he had and went into uh, another direction. This is someone I'm not sure if the two of you are familiar with. I happen to have read one of his books many years ago. Uh, it's called Many Lives, Many Masters. And his name is Dr. Brian Weiss. Some of you may be familiar with him because he's had many seminars up and down the East Coast. We've well, attended some of his seminars. And you have attended, yes. see, now I didn't know that. Yes. Um, and when I was thinking about 
tonight's topic, which was marriage, I remembered in that book that he had, uh, what he does is he would put someone into hypnosis to help them if they have some really severe uh, problems emotionally, behaviorally, what have you. And evidently with one of his patients, um, it ended up stumbling into what was considered or is considered a past life of hers. And of course, all of this has been replicated, duplicated, and validated by scientists and his colleagues. So he's not a hoax, he's not a fake. And he's practicing now, and he's a very well-respected graduate of Columbia University and Yale Medical School. Um, and he now works in Mount Sinai Medical Center in, in Miami, which I guess is also a teaching hospital. I also went to a seminar that he had, too, and that was about a week or two weeks before mm -hmm. I went to Matthew Manning's oh. seminar, in, uh, in a seminar in East Hartford. Okay. Yes, now I remember. Yeah. Now, he, he regressed this patient back and, and really proved that she's had multiple lifetimes, and some of the problems she's had now in this lifetime didn't have anything to do with early childhood, but he went back to early childhood, mm -hmm. and then what happened is he went further, and he was having her go lifetime to lifetime, and in one of those previous lifetimes, she had a specific problem. For example, I'm not going to say what the, the issue was. She might have been afraid of fire. She might have been afraid of drowning, mm -hmm. because she had mm -hmm. that horrific experience back then, and it was stored in her soul. Now, why I'm talking about this author is because he also talked about soulmates in his book and how he had one patient who, and, and I'm, I hope to put this in the right way, who ended up coming together with another one of his patients who didn't know each other, but because of past lives mm -hmm. were actually brought together, which was a phenomenal story. And they were brought together. I'm not sure if they ended up getting married or not. I, I, I can't remember that part right now. But it made me think of how interesting that is when we talk about marriage mm -hmm. and we talk about the union of two people. Of course, marriage is really mm -hmm. the legal term, but, but it could be just considered a union of souls, if you will. And, and how interesting that is and how this man um, is all about this now. And now he's traveling the country and publishing more books and how he really has gone from taking uh, the Western medical approach and combining it with a spiritual approach and how the two are working together. Now, I wanted to know what you thought. A Awan ta ta talked about soulmates, and he, what he basically said that was when the universe was first created, all souls were created. And at one point, they, at that point, they were both male and female. And that it was um, at a certain point that, this, that the different um, charges, because the, the soul has a, has a, a charge to it, like, like, a, like a battery does, a positive and a negative. And the positive part went to the male, and the negative part went to the female. That's not good and bad, it's just an electrical charge. Mm -hmm. And that the, that separated. And that when people, and each, so when a, a male finds a, the female that he was originally united with and, mm -hmm. and won, that's a soulmate. Hmm. In other words, they shared a soul that split apart, and, that, and, they, are, and they reunite in, 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 in a physical sense. Um, when um, that, that this this concept of, of of having male and female souls is in Judaism, it's in the Kabbalah. It's in mm. in a book called the Zohar. Um, I've I've seen quotes about it, although I haven't had a seen it actually in the Zohar. And it also goes back to the story of Adam and Eve, uh, again because when that was when that was originally translated, and it talks about God making making the female, that it says in the Hebrew that. Uh, that he took, uh, they took a rib out of Adam, or at least that's what it says in English. In Hebrew, the word is uh, Selah. And the word Selah in, in, in throughout the Bible is translated as si side into mm -hmm. English. And it's only translated as rib in, in Genesis, in, in the story about Adam and Eve. So what actually happened was that, that God took the, the female aspect or female side of, of Adam's soul and separated it into male and female and created and created another physical body for Eve. And but see Christianity has taken that and uh, said that Adam was created first and therefore he he has 
he's superior, to, you know, males are superior to, to females, and they've said that women women can't speak in church because because they're not as equal to men. And even back into the 1850s, a woman couldn't couldn't address any, couldn't go into a, a lecture hall and address, and address the public, you know, if there were males there, because because of the of these rules uh, that that were created long ago, all based on a mistranslation <laughs> that was definitely that was definitely engineered in order to subjugate women, because women were more psychic than men, and they didn't want the women to 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 go into a trance state and say something that contradicted church doctrine. That was constantly changing all the time. I re I read something else that that really really annoyed me this week. It had to do with with someone called Saint Ambrose. He's mm -hmm. he was a uh, he was a bishop of Milan. We saw the Milan Cathedral. Mm -hmm. uh, he was bishop in in that in in that place. Oh, actually, we, that place wouldn't have existed back in 379 when he when he was there. But in that city, and uh, and basically he he was raised. Non, by pagans, by non-Christians, he was not really a Christian, but he happened to be in the right place in the right time. And the bishop, the bishop of Milan, had just died, and for some reason, they decided to make him bishop. And he didn't. He was not ordained. He was not a priest. He wasn't even a Catholic. He had never been baptized. Oh. And Carl and I remember go, when we went into into France and we went to that cathedral where they had all of the skulls of the babies going going across there and to be, make people afraid because they keep saying that the, the road to hell is paved by uh, with the bones of un, unbaptized babies mm -hmm. because if they aren't baptized immediately and and they die they go straight to hell. This man must have been in his thirties or forties and had and I wasn't concerned about that because that doctrine hadn't been created yet. He was not baptized even. <laughs> he, in fact, he, did, he was reluctant to become baptized because he felt he committed too many sins and was afraid to become baptized. Oh. That was the thinking that back then. <laughs> they weren't afraid of going to hell because they weren't baptized. So that, that whole doctrine hadn't been created yet. Very All created by the church. Yeah. I'd like to share with you something that I had forgotten. Okay. Uh, not too many miles from where we're sitting right now, uh, there's a lady that has been coming to me for, for years, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she first came with a big question, is why is it that her uh, mother does not like her? Why there's such bitterness between them? Mm -hmm. And so uh, one time when I was giving her the reading, this entity came through and said that uh, she was, um, that the mother uh, the two of them were sisters back in Naples, Italy. Oh yeah. And that the uh, the uh, oldest one, her mother, her right. mother was going with a fellow. Yeah. Had a boyfriend, and they were very much in love. But when the girl, the younger sister, was away at school, mm -hmm. and she came home for the first time, and when she did, this boyfriend fell in love with her. Oh my. And they wound up getting <laughs> married. And uh, the rest of her life, the mother, her sister couldn't stand her. So when it came time for her to reincarnate and come back here, she chose, she chose this used to be her sister oh my goodness. to be her mother. Oh my goodness. And she came back and she said that my mother has never liked me from the time I was <gasps> born. She said she can't stand my guts. And she even threw her out of the house when she was a teenager. But you, but you know what? I know that's a sad story and a horrible story, but can you imagine at least knowing that, at least having that answer, mm -hmm. so that now you know it, you can put it in perspective, and you can move on. Right. But going a whole lifetime and not knowing that, yeah. can you imagine the damage and the torture? Well, the, the, the last time that I saw either one of them, both of them came in at the same time. Really? The mother was now anxious to find out why she hated her daughter so much. <laughs> <laughs> and she was told the story. She'd heard the tape, but she was told the story. And to this day, I don't know what happened. It's been quite a while since it well, happened. I hope that you helped them. I'm sure that you did. But remember to, uh, <laughs> I want the people out there to remember that the soul has memory. The soul is like a computer. Mm. It records everything we've ever done from birth to death. Mm. And then we go into the other dimension, all mm. that memory is there. And so when some member of the family, some woman conceives, mm -hmm. her light field changes. The light field is around her body. It goes from an off-white to a rose gold color, and they, in spirit, knows that she has conceived. And if it's someone there that's ready to come back into physical form, they stay in the light field, 
until she's gone 96 days into the pregnancy and then enters through the body, solar, solar plexus, seats itself into the chest region of the little baby, right under the breastbone, mm. and comes into the world as another human being. See? Now, the next show we're going to do is going to, is going to be about children. Good. Because there's some really fascinating information, and we're going to talk about that too. Good. And, and the reason children come in and actually choose their parents. But there's a juicy piece that I have been waiting all night to talk about. Good. And we probably have just enough time to do it, and it's going to blow your socks. And I love it. Let's do it. It's about Jesus, the marriage of all marriages. Jesus was married. Sure he was. Tell me about so it. His, mother, his wife was Mary Magdalene. And the first child they had was a little girl, and the second one was a little boy, a beautiful little boy. Most people couldn't handle that. You realize well, the church, that. The church could not allow the people to realize that Jesus was just an ordinary person born with the gifts of the Spirit, mm -hmm. endowed with the gift of the right. Spirit at birth. Right. And his grandmother, his mother's mother, understood mm -hmm. him very well. Okay. Because in those days, there were, there were mediums, Prophets, mm -hmm. seers, yep. oracles, men of God, women of God. And he's got about a hundred different labels that they have put on these, uh, these gifted people. And the church destroyed thousands of them. Burned the women that were mediums way back, you can tell you, they burned their eyes out because they thought that when they see clairvoyantly, they're mm -hmm. seeing with the physical eyes. They're mm -hmm. seeing with the spirit body's eyes. And when they hear the voices of someone in another dimension, they're hearing through the airs of the spirit body. Mm -hmm. You see? And they treated him no differently. They destroyed him as well. And they destroyed, it was the priest that destroyed him. Mm. The Jewish priest destroyed him because he was a threat. The people were following him because he had a lot of knowledge mm. that they didn't have. Yeah. Right. Sid, who was he married to? Yeah, he was married to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, Ma Mary Magdalene was a priestess of Isis. Ooh. So she, she was very psychically gifted. And uh, she, um, she carried on af after, afterwards and, uh, and went into France. There um, have been books written ab about this. The Da Vinci Code is quite uh, popular right, right now. Right. But there's a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail that was written by Richard Lee and uh, Henry L Lincoln. They also wrote uh, the Masonic Legacy, which is dealing with the Priory of Zion, which which the Da Vinci Code also talks about. Okay. Another author is called uh, is Lawrence Gardner. He wrote the Bloodline of the Holy Grail, the Hidden Lineage of Jesus Revealed. It's thought that uh, Mary Magdalene was was the Grail. In other words, she was the vessel that that was uh, to carry. On. Uh, the, the lineage and that these and that her children married into the, the kings of France and started this this royal bloodline and that the kings were actually the kings of Europe and were actually related to, to descendants of Jesus. Isn't yes. that something? I have another bomb to drop. All right, go ahead. A one told me that Mary Magdalene was the first pope of the Catholic Church. First pope. Only time they ever had a woman that was a pope. No, they had one after that. They did. Yes. You sure? <laughs> I'm sure. Are you about sure? That. You sure it was a woman, or was it somebody in listen, drag? Listen, listen. Now, what? Now, when the when the pope when the pope gets uh, coronated as as pope, whatever the word they use, they actually have some. He has to sit on a special chair, and somebody has to reach in to make sure he has all the male parts, because that's part of the ceremony. That's <laughs> that somebody makes sure that he's a male because there was a female pope once. Oh my goodness! That's, that, I don't even know where to, where to respond that, on that. that. That's in the Vicars of Christ. That's the name of that book. I okay. don't remember the author's name. Okay. Don't look at me yeah. like that. It's true. <laughs> well, that's a part of the yeah, book I haven't got. Really <laughs> <laughs> well, I I have been hearing a lot about the Da Vinci Code, <laughs> and so just really quickly, who was so? What was Jesus's mother's name? Jesus is mother. Miriam. Name Miriam. 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 A lot of people get that confused. Miriam. Mary Magdalene. Miriam. They don't Miriam. get that. Okay. Well, they were both Miriam. The Mary, Mary wasn't, the ah. Hebrew name was Miriam. Okay, all right. So a lot of people just, like ja that. just like Jesus' name was Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua ben Joseph. Yeah. Okay. Joseph. Yeshua okay. ben Joseph. Yeah. So Jesus was married. The Da Vinci Code is quickly about Da Vinci's art with the Last Supper. Right. And what, had, was, what was and that? Uh, and he had, that he put certain messages in there about, about the fact that he was married and, and, 
and so forth. But he wouldn't come out and say it because for an artist, hey, that wouldn't help your career, would it? Well, they did. They, because <laughs> the church sanctioned a lot of stuff from him, I'm the, sure. Right? He, he lived during the Inquisition, so he would have been he would have been killed for saying any being being saying anything her, her, heretical. Sort of like Nostradamus when exactly. he used to write in prose. Yes. And quatrains, yes. they called and it. And he right? had to disguise what he was writing because the church would burn him too. This lady wow. that we were, we honored, this lady, the artist that we mm. honored a few weeks ago. Right. Right. Uh, they're just telling me now that the one you're talking about, the artist, was is one is helping her. One oh, Leonardo? Yeah. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. Oh, good. Wow. One that's helping her. So, Dot, if you're watching this show, and you'll see it, uh, when will we air the show? Probably next Friday, no? It'll be aired the uh, 28th of November, even though we're now live on the 21st. Wow. Da Vinci. Very interesting. Yes. So there's a lot out there, and there was a lot of secret, secretness, and there were a lot of people trying to cover their butt <laughs> yep. to, survive. to survive. I forgot to tell you people, but since we did the show, there's a lady that contacted her and wants to be her agent for selling all of her oh, paintings. Oh, good for her. Oh, isn't that yeah. great? And it's somebody I happen to know, too, very well. Oh, wow. Good and for her. I, I highly recommend her. I wanted to, um, if we had time, and I think we have, we have just a couple minutes left, I wanted to read this quote that I, I found. I'm always looking at different quotes, and this one really struck me. It's titled Spirituality. I wanted to read that, and then I wanted to wrap up uh, the show. Uh, Spirituality leaps where science cannot yet follow, because science must always test and measure. And much of reality in human experience is immeasurable. Think about that. <laughs> they hit that right on the head. Yep. <laughs> yes, they did. I want to wrap the show up by showing everyone in the audience uh, the book that has first been published, My First Encounter with an Angel, Revelations of Ancient Wisdom. You can contact the phone number at the end of the show or write to the address. If you'd like a copy of the book, Reverend Hewitt will send it to you, and you can send him the money afterwards. Or you can also... Write to our email address, making underscore known at yahoo.com. Tell your friends about the show. It's going everywhere. Any questions, give us a call. With that, thank you, Sydney Schwartz. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Reverend Carl Hewitt. Thank you, Tina. And thank you for watching us. Keep tuned. There's going to be more. Be well.